Okay, everyone, good morning. Welcome to the gathering, the third day. And it's so exciting to be here on this beautiful Sunday morning to see everyone here and everyone on Zoom. My name is Tree Muldrow. I live in Philadelphia the, near the Crossroads Women's Center. I want to welcome everybody. And we have an exciting setup this morning. But first, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Sacred Lenny Lenape ground. And I would like to take a moment for us to reflect on this, to honor our ancestors, and just meditate on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, again, welcome everyone. Um, this is our third day of our gathering. And uh, today we have lighting panel. We have Nina, Selma James, Margaret Prescott, Swarthy, who's coming in a few minutes, I think. Um, and I just, you know, want to personally say that I'm so excited to be here and I'm rambling because I am excited. <laughs> and I'm going to hand this over to Nina, who will do the formal introductions. Is there any other, before that, is there any other announcements that I need to make this morning for everyone? It is? Okay. The Spanish translation is happening, and could I have the name of the translator to acknowledge it? Rosemary and Camila. Okay, thank you, Rosemary and Camila, this is for your hard work. We also have sign language over here, so I'm asking for the translators, and I'm sorry, I don't have your names. Maria? And... Andrea, I'm sorry. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that and give our gratitude for such important work and just uh, remind everyone to speak slowly for the translators. Okay, thank you. I want to introduce Nina and she will continue. Okay, hello, my name is Nina Lopez. Thank you, Tree. I'm from the Global Women's Strike in London and I'm absolutely delighted to be here with the rest of our international network or at least a large part of it. Okay, we have three speakers today, and I will introduce the first one. I'll introduce them one by one. The first speaker is Selma James. Oh, the session is called Autonomy Central to Organizing and Unity. And the first speaker is Selma James, who really needs no introduction among us. But Selma started the Wages for Hustle campaign in 1972. She launched it in 1972. Which the, the Wages for Astro campaign coordinates the global women's strike as we are now better known. And if anybody wants to find out more about Selma and what we all stand for, we have the two anthologies, Sex, Race, and Class, and Our Time is Now, which are available here and are available from PM Press and from Crossroads Books Online. So without further ado, Selma. Take the mic, I think. Yeah, big round of applause for Selma. Oh, I need this. Yes. Right. I see it. I see it. I'll put this here. Good morning. And it's really important that these two panels go together to really finish up, in a way, what we've been doing here for the last two days. The first on autonomy in order to be unified, and the second on what we want to win which is a care income for those, all those of every gender who care for people and or the planet. Taking the wealth from those who have stolen it and giving it back to the carers. I want to speak on autonomy, but 
I haven't spoken much on autonomy publicly, and the more I try to put it down on paper, the more I realize how enormous the subject is. So what I want to say is that these are notes towards using autonomy. Because we don't want a theory. What is the use of a theory that doesn't have a practice? And autonomy is a way of organizing. Now, I want to say something about myself and my background. I was, from the age of 15, a member of an organization called the Johnson Forest Tendency. I thought it would be gone and forgotten, but in fact, it's gone, but not forgotten. People are looking back, among other things, because it was formed and led by CLR James, who was very well known, among other things, for the Black Jacobins. In addition, however, he was a very good Marxist and worked very hard to understand, to return to what Marx said and did away from the left, which was very concerned, first of all, with its own leadership of the working class without which nothing could happen, according to them. What happened is that they disintegrated. That is not what people want. They want liberation, not something plastered on top called leadership. And CLR, after he had studied Marx and studied him hard, understood that if it doesn't come from the grassroots, it's, if it doesn't come from the ground up, it's not what we want. We want an organization that's not top down, but from the bottom, everybody rising together. He did a study of the Civil War in the United States, the Second American Revolution, and he found the struggle of the slave not to be a slave was a crucial part of what we had to know about racism in the US and the relationships that we inherit in this country and therefore in other parts of the world. He said that the independent, wait a second, I have to get the phrase right. The independent what? Yes, <laughs> I forget words, but not ideas. The independent validity of the Negro's struggle was what we had to fight for in the movement. That is, the independent struggle of people of color, of black people in the US, had a validity for all movements which had to adopt this position in relation to the struggle of black people. We all had to be anti-racist. There were many things he did not say, but this he absolutely said, and I was raised on this when I, from when I was 15, that this independent validity, this importance of this movement to every movement had to be understood and accepted. We formed a newspaper, Correspondence. The reason it was called Correspondence was he said there's more truth in the letters we write to each other than the articles that we write. We tell the truth to each other and then we write something else for the paper. And he said we'll call it Correspondence because it will be mainly the Correspondence. The Correspondence, by the time Correspondence was founded, I had written, because he insisted on it, 
a pamphlet called A Woman's Place, which described the work of the housewife fundamentally. And what it said, as I look back, is that men and women live separate lives. And I described this catastrophe, this disaster, this tragedy in a day-to-day -day way. There isn't a, quote, political word in it. So when we formed the newspaper, there was a woman's page. Only women could, anybody could write it, but it had to be about women, and mostly women wrote it. And there was a Negro page because of the independent validity of the Negro struggle. And there was a youth page. That each of these was the autonomy which we were offering to our readers. We tried very hard to represent those of us at the bottom of the organization, that is the grassroots, and he even gave us a school where we learned to deal with our own leadership, that is him and the rest. We learned to stand up to our leaders. That was part of the education of Johnson Forrest. Um, Johnson Forrest lasted for a number of years and did a lot of work. But what it did mostly was educate the rest of us, educate those of us in it. And I have to say, it's an important part of what the wages for housework had become. The concentration on the grassroots, the fact that the grassroots must govern, must frame the organization. I learned there from the age of 15 and I, brought it and it has been accepted by those of us in the Wages for Housework campaign. Now, one of the things that we were very keen on in John's Forest is that we were not going to fight for the leadership of the trade unions. We were going to fight for the grassroots within the trade unions. And by the time the 60s began, the struggle of trade of workers in the factories had reached a point where you could see workers striking a picket line around the UAW, the United Auto Workers. And that soon became, that is, they were picketing their own union because while they couldn't do without the union to defend themselves, they couldn't do anything else, and they couldn't even defend itself very well. And they formed the um, drum. Do people remember, anybody remembers drum? The Dodge, yes, good. The Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement. The struggle in the street went into the factory and people were forming their own organization, autonomous of the unions, but within the unions. And other uh, uh, great movements began. The black movement was in the street everywhere. M Malcolm was talking about all the things that black people said when white people weren't present. He said that publicly, that was shocking, made people very uncomfortable if they were white. Um, the women's movement began, and I want to talk about that, what we mean by the women's movement. There was feminism talking about many important things like abortion, but before we accepted that, we said women had the right to have or not to have children. That is, we have a right to have abortion, but we have a right to have money to have the children we want to have and feed them. And that was not the position of feminism. I'll tell you what women were doing. I have a picture 
of women's autonomy. This is a page from a book, and it tells you what non-white, I think they mean black, people were doing. Thank you for holding it. Can you manage? Yes, good. When black women, when black men lost jobs, put my microphone down. Put it back up to your mouth. Oh, when black men lost jobs, black women applied for welfare until 19. 63 or 1964 but at that point black women black men began to get jobs there was jobs there was you know you you were able to get yourself a job and the number of unemployed black men went down but the number of black women demanding money in the form of welfare skyrocketed. They didn't want the men's money, they wanted their own money and they fought for it everywhere in the US. It was the biggest wages for housework movement in the world. And the women's movement didn't know, the feminist movement, the ward, largely white movement didn't notice that this was happening. They took the chance of making a movement to get their own money. Thank you, I'm going to put this down and I think People later can come up and look at it. It's such a graphic example, a quantification of what we saw happening. The most fantastic movement, the most, uh, 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 this is what we won from the women's movement, from that movement. We won Margaret Prescott, who worked with that movement and was educated by that movement. And she'll speak about that, I have no doubt later. We were part, that movement was part of the 60s, the movement of the 60s. And not only was there a women's movement and a massive black movement, but there was a, a Latino movement, a Chicano movement, a native Indian movement aimed at, American Indian movement and many movements, smaller movements among them. There was a gay movement and soon as there was established gay movement, there was a lesbian movement where women took their autonomy, not only as lesbian women, but as women. There was a movement of people with disabilities, which had never been seen in this massive way before. There was a movement of people in the, in the, the organizations that where they called them mad and these people said, we're not mad, you know, there's something else going on in our world which we don't like and which our bodies and our minds cannot deal with. There were movements everywhere. And when the 60s had really established itself, we had a new conception of who we as human beings were. We knew a lot more than we'd found out in the trade unions. We knew about us, more about our sexuality. We knew more about our relationships. We knew more about our children. We knew more about our parents. We knew more about the lives that we wanted to live. It was a massive, mass education, self-education. It was a mass taking of autonomy. I'm speaking about the US. Much the same happened in other countries. And in fact, one of the most extraordinary expressions of autonomy was Bandung in 1953. The whole of what was called the third world 
the whole of the South came together and said, we are not with the Russians. We are not with the Americans. We are self-aligned, independently aligned. We are with each other. And that was, you know, a move so fantastic and it seems to have got lost as part of we, what we must know. That produced, among other things, a little wages for housework campaign in 1972. And we began to learn about welfare then. We knew about our ancestors. We knew about them who formed <coughs> Uh, a movement which got us um, a, a family allowance in some countries where every woman once a week could go to the post office and collect a small amount of money for her children. And it, it was tremendously important that they had that money because it meant a lot of women didn't bother to get married. Well, the government was alarmed, but there was not much they could do unless they took the money away, and they tried that once. In 1972, soon after we were formed, we immediately organized against it, and they backed down. You can't take money away from people once they have it. It feels so good in your pocket and in your relationships, and in the way you can walk away from a relationship which is violent or in other ways de destructive to your happiness. So we formed our Wages for Housework campaign, a few people, in a situation where the feminists said, that we should not be asking for wages for housework. What we needed, wait for it, we needed to go out to work to get the consciousness that men had, trade union consciousness. Honestly, I, I can't even believe that I remember it. But it was, it was absurd. And we, they said it would institutionalize us in the home if we had wages for housework. And we said, we are institutionalized in the home because we don't have wages for housework. And we fought it out and began immediately after we had won the family allowance, we began to fight for mothers who were losing their children because they were lesbian. The mothers were lesbian and they said, that lesbian women were unfit mothers. We fought against deportation of women and sometimes of men. We didn't do a lot of this work. We did some of it because we were also trying to defend ourselves with a constant attack. The left was furious. We said we were Marxists and hadn't consulted them. You, you think I'm joking. But that was how it was. A women making an analysis of Marx that talks about reproducing the whole working class. This was too much. They didn't like us. And we were left out of all kinds of things. But we went ahead. We got a squat. And we began to do street events and in other ways to develop our own views and our understanding. We had a lovely, we were immediately, by the way, I do, should have said this earlier, we were building an international network. Everything had to be international. We didn't want wages for housework for 30 housewives in Brooklyn, New York. We wanted it for every woman who was doing this work of reproducing the whole human race and they they said what did you do with during the day nothing she doesn't work she's a housewife that's what they said then 
If you don't hear it now, it's because we fought against it for some years until we defeated it. Everything we have, we fought for. They gave us nothing. We were very attractive to single mothers who had a small income in the UK and uh, also to well, some welfare mothers in the US. And Margaret may tell you about that. But fundamentally, we were making an international network. And one product of that, aside from groups in the US, there was a great group in Toronto. There was a very good group in Italy. We worked very closely with Italy. Uh, and we developed other relationships in other countries. We tried the best we could. We put a lot of our money, what little money we had, we put in telephone bills. That's the only way to build an international. If it's not the phones that we have today, they charged you through the nose. Sometimes the lines were poor. Um, but you, you had to stay in touch. And the only way you could do that is put all your money into phones. Um, the Toronto group attracted a group of lesbian women, and they really thought that wages for housework was the cat's meow. They really liked it. They said, yes, you could be. Our slogan was coming out in millions with wages for housework. That is, wages for housework would enable women to come out as lesbian in a way that we had not known before. And they said, we want to join the Wages for Housework campaign, but we don't want to give up our group. And we said, the, Toronto, and we talked about it, and we asked the people and all the rest, and we said, yes, come in, keep your group. We will have an independent group of lesbian women inside the Wages for Housework campaign. And Everybody rejoiced. They began to, there were love affairs. Why not? It wasn't illegal and it wasn't looked down on in our organization, although many lesbian or many feminist women, feminists were very unhappy about um, lesbian women being in the same organization with others. But there were problems. They didn't know, and, and we didn't either before that, they didn't know they had to be accountable to the rest of us for everything that they were doing. We were not having lack of accountability. We were accountable to each other, whatever organization we had. And uh, we worked out how to do that. And had long debates about it, but it was agreed that an organization could hold its own meetings, could hold its own events in consultation with others, but that we were universally accountable to each other. The next organization to join was, was to form really, was women in the campaign who came out as sex workers, the English collective of prostitutes. In, in France, they had made a great strike and the women had taken over churches. And um, so they called themselves the same name as the, fr the French women. It was the French prostitutes collective and this was the English collective of prostitutes. And they wrote a fantastic paper especially the 17-year-old, who was the youngest of them, four prostitutes against prostitution. Yes, didn't mean, we were not our work. We were four housewives against housework. We were for the worker, not for the work. That was our policy, and it had, really enabled the ECP 
to get on board. And there was then the women, Black Women for Wages for Housework was formed at about the same time. We're not sure yet. We'll have to look at the archives, which are in process. And that changed everything. It meant that the whole of the Wages for Housework campaign had to understand what racism looked like. We were largely white women, and we didn't, weren't sensitive, and the black women had to train us and represent us and educate us and also brought the tremendous work that each of them had done. I mentioned two. One of them was Margaret, who spoke and trained us on the life in the, in, in the um, welfare movement, what the welfare movement was about, and how broad it was, and how many things could be done once the welfare had been won. And she'll talk about her own struggle and, and uh, part of the break that that caused. And the other woman had been in the Black Panther movement and knew a lot about the struggle there of women against the men who hadn't learned anything. They learned a lot about racism, but they didn't understand that there was also sexism they had to deal with. And that was part, that became part. Every single woman who joined the campaign in any country extended what we knew, extended what we understood, and extended the struggle that we were involved in you know, to know more about the struggle that you yourself are involved in is a crucial part of the, what, the woman, what the movement has to teach us. Um, we built our international, and then uh, we found another, another organization, Win Visible, Women with Visible and Invisible Disabilities. And that raised the question because each of these organizations raised other questions of the relationships between us and how we were to unify against the differences. That's really what you want to do. You want to unify taking the differences into account, not covering them over, exposing them and see how to surmount them collectively. That's what autonomy is about. And they began to say that we didn't, they, those of us who had disabilities and needed carers didn't want those carers to be exploited. They wanted their own money and they wanted others who took care of them to get a decent wage so they didn't take out on each other what they didn't get in, in pay. I don't think we, there was a whole thing, women against rape was not in the wages for housework campaign, but it assumed that if women had money, they would leave violent relationships, and it fought for rape in marriage to be criminalized. A man could rape his wife legally. In most countries of the world, it was like that then, probably in every, but in a lot of countries now, a man cannot rape his wife or any other woman. Whether the police deal with it is another question, and we could have a long discussion on how they do nothing. But we fought for, for the autonomy of women from the rapist who pays the rent. We did a book on that, and we did other books as well. Uh, I don't think there were other organizations, but we understood. Have I forgotten any, anybody? Oh. Ah, there was a group of men who began in the 70s, quite early, to work with us. And the deal was, 
they were not in the campaign, but they were in supportive of the campaign, and we were accountable to them and they to us. Payday has been a tremendously important organization uh, between us and working very well together. We've had one or two bumps, but nothing much. We understand each other, we work together, and they deal with the question of refuseniks. They deal with the question of anti-war. They're part of the work that we do with them against the war, and they can tell you more about it, and I hope they do speak in the discussion. So what we have in as an organization of a number, in a number of countries. Now we are beginning to have a campaign in Italy again. Italy was part of, of, of Europe of racist, sexist, imperialist Europe. And some of that did not end uh, at the door of the Wages for Housework campaign. And it exploded, and the New York Committee broke up because of the racism of the white women and especially influenced by Italy. We lost Italy, but we're regaining it in a number of ways now. This is the movement that we have formed. We are respectful of each other. We consult each other. We support each other, but we uh, concentrate on the particular uh, ways in which we as women are exploited. There's nobody who says your struggle is not as important as mine. Nobody says I am more exploited than you are. We have agreed that all of us have been exploited and that we need each other to end it. We concentrate on different aspects of our exploitation, but we do not compete for who's the most exploited. That was one of the things that I was most anxious about establishing. We have a lot of autonomy within the organization, which benefits the organization, and which is very attractive, and also we have discovered very effective in the struggle. I'll just mention this and then uh, end there. I think I must be running out of time. <laughs> when women come to us who are asylum seekers, and there is in, in England, and there is the All African Women's Group, which meets at our center, asylum seekers. They come because they have witnessed the most horrendous crimes against themselves or even members of the family. And they're running away from the impact, the final impact of imperialism, because imperialism walked right in after the independence movement. I want to tell you one thing about that. After the Second World War, Franklin Roosevelt said, look, you know, it's time for these colonies to be free and, um, and, and more free because they're complaining. And um, Ch uh, Churchill says, we're not giving up our empire. You know, I have not become the, God, the queens or king, whatever it was at the moment, first minister in order to see the destruction of the British Empire. And Roosevelt, a practical man and a wealthy one, said, 
there's no problem. Give them a flag on the national anthem. He said that, and we heard it. And we knew that they were planning to come back once we had fought for our independence in whatever country we were and whatever masters they were imposing on us. And we face that today as part of the international movement against the domination that always existed between the big industrial powers and the, what we used to call the third world and what we now call the global south. We stand against Zionism because we stand against uh, um, the, the brutality and the, what's it? The apartheid, thank you. Remember, I know the, the idea. It's only the word I forgot. We stand against autonomy, um, 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 apartheid everywhere. And we stand against the offer that um, Israel is making to Jews to be the master race. We're against the master race, not only in Germany, but in Israel. And we, we are part of the anti-racist and anti-imperialist movement. And we stand for the autonomy of working class people from all those organizations of whatever stripe who want to exploit us. And we, we're building the international movement, and we welcome you to join it with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Selma. Uh, okay, our next speaker will be online. Now, can you connect? It's uh, Swati in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, hi, Nina. Ah, here online. she is. Okay, yes. let me introduce. It's a great pleasure to introduce as our second speaker on our autonomy session. So speaking all the way from India, Swati Renduchintala, and it's late for her. Swati works in sustainable food systems and climate change. She's an associate scientist with World Agroforestry Center, deployed with the Andhra Pradesh Community Managed Natural Farming Program. And she will speak more specifically about the women's self-help groups which have been central to that program and are an extraordinary mass example of autonomy, of women's autonomy. Swati, a great pleasure. Please go ahead. Uh, namaste. Yes, perfect. So, uh, namaste everyone. Uh, my name is Swati and uh, I firstly want to thank Selma for that wonderful keynote speech that she gave and she has been an inspiration and a champion for the work uh, on natural farming along with Nina, Didi, Solvik and the entire team of Global Women's Strike. So I am very sure that this technical uh, issue must have taken the spotlight away from the point of discussion that we were, uh, we are discussing on autonomy. So these three words of autonomy, agency and empowerment, these are extremely crucial. They seem extremely overused. But in real sense, in countries like India and, you know, former colonies, these words have, are, are of primal importance because women, marginalized societies, 
and the caste system has actually kept a massive a number of population in uh, southeast asia under uh, below poverty line so my narrative for the next 10 15 minutes would be to give a hope that while this problems persist poverty persist in the world till today but what we have done to to really uh, uh, address it and give you a case study from india from the state of andhra pradesh that uh, will be able to instill confidence that women can attain autonomy as selma said on the various facets of of autonomy but the key ingredient the key ingredient is women coming together the manifestation of uh, on the harnessing of the collective power of women will actually help us un- ensure empowerment autonomy as well as agency so uh, with your permission i will share with you uh, i i will provide a visual aid as well so that i i'll uh, so that i'll be able to tell my uh, narrative better i am hoping that you are able to see my screen can can the interpreter give me a uh, thumbs up can can somebody tell me that they are able to see my screen right yes perfect i can see that so this is a case study from uh, one of the largest states in india it's andhra pradesh and what we are saying so i'll give you a context poverty is has been a crucial problem since 1947 when india got independence poverty is so rampant that peop- that the last 50 years since till independence from independence from 1950 to 1990 it put the policy makers the bureaucrats and public under a lot of thinking that so much so many schemes have been brought about in 50 years in india but poverty was not going anywhere there were schemes there was money being put in what exactly how how this viciousness of poverty is really impacting why is it something which is not able we are not able to pull it out what is the causality of it so it has been a matter of huge discrimination discussions and discourses that what should be done what kind of Uh, problems and causes are, is is not ensuring that in spite of so much of energy and rigor that has gone in 50 years since the independence of india that people are still poor the human development indicators are really bad women are uh, suffering children are suffering so this has by by 1990s and mid of 90s this was a big issue that is 1995 is where the sarc the south asia association for regional cooperation which includes country of india pakistan sri lanka as well as uh, bangladesh nepal they all came together because we share common histories and common problems and it was realized that the problem that persists is the till now the development paradigm is completely passive to the poor please refer to my visual aid on the left side you will see that 50 years since the independence of india poverty was looked at as as something where poor will not involved so somebody else it was a top driven approach there somebody sitting in some office a heat office was making plans for to do address poverty and to uh, address the inequality which has resulted into till the mid of 90s it was realized that poverty was not going and that poor were kept on fringes for making to address their own problems and they were looking as just objects as beneficiaries this terminology also was very critical you know they are just looking as somebody who needs to be served and the problem was the institutions that were built were built institution for poor this was the left and the, the development paradigm was such but in 1995 as i mentioned or that the sarc countries came together there was a major brainstorming and there was this report that came uh, came out which suggested which is called the meeting the challenges it's a major breakthrough report you would see that what that report suggested was that poor should be included in the discussions for poor 
there should be a right based approach for development and we have to build institutions of course it's institution so the, the previous development paradigm was institution for poor now we are talking institutions of poor so there is a difference and this difference was what gave genesis to the poverty elimination program and alleviation program we are talking so yes i can hear you very faintly neena okay. swati can you slow down it's just the sound is not fantastic and the translators are having a bit of trouble following so if you could sure. slow down that would really be helpful thank you sure am i audible do am i audible yes yes we can hear you yes perfect so the poverty Elimi elimination program focused on three crucial elements it talks uh, talked about the right based approach to development we to talked about the social mobilization aspect where we enable the poor to build their own organization and we are saying that poor should become part of the discussion in uh, for, for poverty alleviation and elimination and that was the breakthrough now of this what we realized was that it was an it was very difficult to bring, mobilize men in india especially to bring men together it requires immense immense effort immense resources and immense time on the other hand it was realized that women are easier to bring together easier to form institution they are, they are easier to have a cohesive bond to build a cohesive bond because the problems of women are much more common and that is the genesis of the women self help group and this is the genesis of what the women self help group is now i will break here and i will ask you this question you know the biggest problem in in in, in with women was that the financial independence the financial autonomy has been very missing into their entire household whenever they want money they are dependent on men so this economic disempowerment has led to a lot of crucial problems that selma has mentioned this led to a lot until date it happens by the way that economic empowerment has really stopped women from going out of their houses from getting away from toxic relationships not being able to you know uh, educate the children not being able to take care of their health not have access to assets so this has been very a, a problematic uh, situation so what was realized that mobilizing women into institutions is extreme crucial and what is the factor that will bring women together is that they form saving groups among themselves and that is the key element that 10 to 15 women groups uh, women came together to form group of women self help group that we call today these 10 to 15 women the common factor when it was started in 95 it was on the credit and thrift mechanism what is credit and thrift basically women put their own it is like a small bank i want to give you hello yeah it is like a small bank of women 10 to 15 women come together they form a self help group and this is a small bank i just want to give you a, get an example this small bank is where women they put their money so the in this the smallest of denomination so if there are 10 women every women put 10 rupees or for your example i can say 1 dollar for example so every women put 1 dollar so there are 10 women so it become 10 dollars now this 10 dollars is their uh, resource it's their capital that is available and any women who requires for example for buying cow or somebody may want to pay the fees of their children so they borrow out of, of this 100 dollars whatever amount is required and then they give it back to the sag in installments so what happened was in their own localities in their own spaces they got access to money towards their own and which they can rotate among themselves 
so for example if a woman takes 100 dollars just for an example say so she can return every month 5 5 dollars or 10 10 dollars in installment for the next 10 years and give a very small amount of interest that increases the corpus of the self help group this is crucial because economic empowerment was so imminent need of the hour because it solved problems small household problems it solved problems of education that you know school fees of children it solved problems of uh, availing some groceries items for health and education uh, health purposes for medicines for for uh, accessing some information just going to the bazaars so this availability of 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 this corpus was a breaking this was a small bank which was available at the disposal in their own localities in their own they did not have to go to a city nearby or a village Uh, market to to access and banks were completely against uh, poor for a long period of time because what do bank wants bank works on 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 future money right and poor do not have money to pay so they don't get access to loan they are not able to build as uh, start any business so this breakthrough of women together and rotating their own corpus and not just rotating they document it so they are documenting every rotation because that is the proof that these women are dependable i am telling you this is one of the breakthrough that will really that is answer to the problem of how do you solve poverty that you do not give them keep giving money you know that fish fishing you don't uh, uh, catch fish and feed you teach people fishing right that is the development paradigm so this was teaching fish fishing to the to the women and this is what has led to whatever in 25 years that we are talking about the group today so what happened was that this idea of women coming together rotating money among themselves gave them credibility now over years when they started rotating more money as because every week they meet every week they put 11 $1 every week they put 10 dollars whatever the amount that is decided so the corpus is increased and it is available for people to access in the group now what happened was this is internal corpus of 10 10 now the banks also saw all the documents and realized okay fine you you your your documents are very really good let me give you 100 dollars this is where you know the credibility of women self help groups increased many fold because they were good in documentation and accounting they were able to rotate their own money and they showed it to the world and to the government and all the agencies that we are dependable we take money and return money this is breakthrough that nobody showed interest and belief in poor till date which was able to do by this women self help program now so this was a pilot what i mentioned was the pilot in 1995 so the pilot gave way to a self is society for elimination of rural poverty this entity every intervention requires a support mechanism so self for the support mechanism which was helping form this women self help group and what you can hear i'm sorry the the sound is breaking out quite badly and we're just wondering if that has okay uh, were you not able to hear me at all hold on hold on can you switch off your screen i know that that deprives you of the powerpoint which is a shame but we're wondering if you switch off your screen whether your sound will come across more clearly uh yeah just the video your camera basically my my camera is switched off uh, nina uh, my camera is switched off uh, is that is are you able to hear me what will it make a difference if you switch it up the powerpoint i can't hear yes okay let's try again and pl- please keep it as slowly as you can yes 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 sorry about yeah that. no no problem nina i'm i'm really feeling sad able to communicate better but am i uh, audible to you we can hear you yes perfect yes yes so this is the support mechanism that the 
society for the elimination of rural poverty which is uh, a ngo by the government of india it was a special implementing bill by government of pradesh that was created to scale these self help groups across the state and that is what has led to in 25 years today at 20, on 2023 has this women self help group platforms have become the source of last mile connectivity for every development intervention please let us let us understand what has happened in the last 25 years these self help groups have become platform for all government intervention it's the last mile connectivity platforms so we be it health health related intervention be it education related intervention be it any any kind of insurance any kind of development intervention the women self help group over the last 25 years have become so 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 believe to burdi that there is no other platform in country like india which is such such trustworthy as the women self help group platforms and that what has this helped us to achieve it has helped us to achieve that every family in the state let me just uh, put it on the screen one yeah so what is it it able to achieve that it's it has given a life of dignity the voice of the women were heard it helped gain decent income it helped freedom from hunger it has helped in risk management of the livelihood portfolio now what is the key take away from what i am saying is that we need to have institutions of poor especially of women who are able to self manage and self finance their entire intervention and we support the ecosystem that helps them achieve this and then we build social capital so women see today swati speaking to to somebody in philadelphia is different than swati speaking to a rural woman so women who have become part of the institution speaks to other women and that is the kind of peer to peer bondage that happens because they go they have gone through the same kind of story same kind of narrative same kind of uh, injustice so women who have become part of uh, self help groups help other women to come out of poverty and that is the social capital we are talking about nobody else can help that kind of intervention now this is the uh, reflection of whatever has happened the today if you can see the last 20 this is the work of the last 25 years that around 1 uh, 10 million more than 10 million women have been uh, brought under 1 million self help group around 44000 more self help groups have been federated and then these are higher level of federation if you can see these vo it means village organization these are federations of the collectives the collectives so that is what has achieved in day now this is the model we will not go in it and this is yeah. so this is my last slide then we are talking about that we need to build social capital of the women we need to build social capital of the poor and we need to bring them together now i started my narrative by saying that the agency empowerment and autonomy is extremely crucial what do we mean by autonomy in, in 25 years the women in andhra pradesh are able to today gain access to any kind of money required from bank for their livelihood intervention for their health for for the education of the children for gaining assets and this kind of economic autonomy there are several other forms but this economic autonomy is extremely crucial and this self help group movement was able to do that the second kind of autonomy is the social autonomy where the household dynamics have changed because women are the way the the uh, instruments which are bringing money into the household so domestic violence cases have reduced 
women the the cases of violence against women in the society in the rural societies have improved so the social and economic autonomy that the self help groups have been able to bring has been extremely crucial i'm really sorry that i couldn't really uh, help tell the story better because of technical difficulties but uh, i hope my the, the story of the women of self help group in andhra pradesh was able to reach you all meena i hand over to you thank you very much swati we're really sorry about the technical difficulties correct but i think we have been able to follow what you said yes and we got a good sense of the mass scale on which women have been able to organize in self help groups and the enormous impact that they have had on society generally their families their communities and society generally in andhra pradesh Now I don't know if you want to stay for the rest we're going to have a discussion after Margaret speaks or if it's too late you should tell us but if you if you can stay that's that's fine obviously we'll miss you <laughs> we got a lot out of your presentation despite the technical difficulties So we'll go with our next speaker Margaret Hansford go ahead hold on a second Ready to go? All righty. Thank you, and 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 thank you, Swati. I mean, we we really need to learn more about these women's self-help organizations and the in India, in Andhra Pradesh, and the impact it has had on women getting some power, getting some money in their hands, but also how they have been able to use the autonomy of having. some money in their hands to attack other issues like domestic violence and more okay so perhaps in the discussion we'll be able to learn a bit more about that now the question of autonomy the unity of autonomy a lot of confusion over what is autonomy it gets mixed up with separatism and i'll say a bit more about that and then there are those who don't want to address autonomy at all because they believe we all have to be together and autonomy just separates us misunderstanding the possibility of unity within autonomy now and this this really is a question for all of our movements right now selma often speaks about in every movement there's tension within the movement about the direction that that movement is going to go either it is a movement that is focused even with autonomous expression on changing the world or just wanting a piece of the pie and becoming you know a better capitalist uh, organization right i do want to say a little bit though that because there have been some expressions of autonomy that didn't call itself autonomy but i think in listening to uh to you know to what selma had to say what i've been able to read about um clr james um you know to to help me to figure this out for example recently we filmed in the poor people's campaign in california a film called um on martin luther king mlk and it goes from montgomery to memphis when we look at montgomery and what happened the bus boycott if you don't know about that you could look it up where for over a year black people refused to take the bus right that was to me an expression of black autonomy of black people taking their autonomy to make a point and we were able to stick together if you could imagine people walked they organized alternative transport they did whatever they could not to get on those buses protesting black people having to sit at the back of the bus another expression of autonomy i think in the civil rights movement what's known as the civil rights era because there are several of them i think has to do with the 
Selma mentioned in Johnson Forest how you had the youth page. The role of young people and youth in the civil rights era, some of those early um, sit-ins, the lunch counter, those were young people, those were students. And you could see even um, in some of the footage that you see of protests and people being hosed down and attacked by dogs, et cetera, you see a lot of very, very young people. I mean, 13, 14, 15 year olds walking out of school, you know, joining the movement. So the, that, that, that those sit-ins, which led to so much, was also in a way youth giving some leadership, right? And also in some ways taking some autonomy. And that led then to what some saw as a split, but it really wasn't a split in the civil rights era with the founding of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Because again, you could tell the word student in there. These were young people. And it was a woman, a black woman, Ella Baker, who was part of Martin Luther King's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, who said to King and who said to others, wait a minute, these students need their own organization, right? It was an autonomous, in a way, organization of, of students. And there's a lot that happened within SNCC. And I'll, I'll, I'll just have to say too, there is um, a book called Hands of the Freedom Plow that tells a story of women in SNCC, a story that doesn't come out that much, but is really an important story. And we also learn the connection of the kind of leadership that happened within SNCC by the young people, but also with the women that then led to SNCC taking a position against the war, the Vietnam War. This was before Martin Luther King made his famous uh, Beyond uh, Vietnam uh, speech, but also some of the beginnings of the women's movement, women autonomy, women in SNCC did write about that, of obviously dealing with the sexism within the organization. Um, the, also just to say, uh, coming out of SNCC and getting into the more militant, what's called the militant uh, black movement, um, you know, where Stokely Carmichael, now known as Kwame Ture, became the president of the Student Nonviolent Coordinator, there were a lot of internal struggles happening there because there were some within SNCC was always a multiracial organization. It wasn't only a black organization. And as the militant black movement was expressing itself, there were people who said, look, we just need to be black folks. We don't need to be in this organization with white people. And then there were white people, white people need to go in their own communities and organize their own communities. So there was really a lot of discussion and misunderstanding about the difference between separatism and autonomy because that struggle could have been resolved with autonomy in the way Selma described it but with people being accountable to each other rather than feeling you have to divide one from the other and not have to do anything one doesn't have to do anything with the other um the the other thing, I, I just want to fast, Selma talked about the, um, the welfare rights movement. And one of the ways, a women's movement, in that civil rights era, the welfare rights movement, Black-led welfare rights movement, they were also giving some leadership and direction to the civil rights movement, including to King, MLK. There's a very famous story um, the Welfare Rights Organization and, and uh, Annie, Reverend Annie Chambers, who's here, was part of the welfare, National Welfare Rights Organization, where Martin Luther King wanted to put forward some legislation, right? And he wanted the support of the welfare movement, the National Welfare Rights Organization. And he came in and he started to present about his piece of legislation and why they needed the, the support of the Welfare Rights Organization. And I, I can't remember if it was Johnny Tillman or one of them said, excuse me, Dr. King, that interrupted the great man and says, Dr. King, 
If you don't know, say you don't know. Because we want to tell you about poverty. Because you didn't come from poverty. And we want to tell you what our situation is. And then Dr. King, to his credit, stopped. Then he listened to those women. And a lot of us believe that it was a result of that confrontation that then led King in the direction of calling for the Poor People's Campaign. And, in this, and after King was assassinated, and you heard Coretta Scott King talking about that first Poor People's Campaign, and she talks about the women. It began on Mother's Day, right? And they were really trying to make that connection with women. So I just wanted to raise that as an autonomous organization of impoverished, you heard Swati talk about organizations of impoverished women, the role that that organization then played in pushing King and in pushing him forward with the um, moving to economic justice. And I'll have to say too, it was the young women in SNCC that also pushed King on the whole issue of coming out against the Vietnam War, okay? Um, the one thing I wanted to mention too, I think a lot of you may know that once MLK did come out against the Vietnam War and in many ways took his autonomy from all of these organizations that had been funding the civil rights movement that advised him against it, stay in your lane, just stick with civil rights, don't get into economic issues, don't get into foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy, and King said, no, silence is betrayal, remember that, right? But he had those young people pushing him also in that direction. I'll have to say after he did that, a lot of the money and a lot of the support from the churches and even some of the major civil rights organizations dried up for King. The money dried up the support uh, dried up, but to his credit, he stuck with it. I want to fast forward a little bit now, um, you know, again, talking about uh, autonomy. For, I started out as a, as a young teacher in Ocean Hill Brownsville in Brooklyn, uh, New York. Ocean Hill Brownsville was considered the largest and most impoverished urban poverty district, school district in the United States at that time. I'm not talking rural, I'm talking about urban. And there was a big fight going on in Ocean Hill Brownsville for community control of schools, okay? And that was all part of the civil rights era and the black movement era because the mothers especially were saying, look, our kids aren't learning anything. And you teachers here, you all are white. This community, you got black and Puerto Rican students. You don't know anything about us. Not only that, but you're racist. You're treating our children like they're trash, right? And I learned from my mother, who was a school teacher, that what the best teacher does is appreciates and loves her students and understand that each and every person has something to contribute. And what our job is, is to bring the best out of them. Now what happened is that there was a, a teacher's strike going on at the time because the teacher's union opposed the black and Puerto Rican community trying to take their autonomy in the schools and fought it, right? So here you had a community-led struggle led by um, you know, a lot, when you read about Ocean Hill Brownsville, you hear a lot about the men, you don't hear a lot about the women, but I could tell you, it was those welfare mothers who were in the community, who were not yet forced out into the factories, or the ones who weren't living maids, right? Who were the ones on a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day level that were down at the schools that protected our principal, Luis Fuentes, the little Puerto Rican uh, guy that were always trying to arrest him. These were the militant mothers who really kept that struggle going, and you don't hear a lot about them, you know, when you read uh, the, the history of that movement. And that gave me a real education about who welfare mothers were. 
I'm a villager. I come from the village in the Caribbean, a small place in the Caribbean. We didn't have no welfare, <laughs> obviously. But it became very, very clear where the leadership was coming from in those communities. It was coming from those welfare mothers who were able to maintain those fights and to protect the, the administrators, like the principal of PS 155, who was taking a position to protect him. That fight also led to um, the open admissions program at the City University of New York. That was a major thing, and a lot of people don't credit welfare mothers for that. They think it's something else, but that was a fight, that one that grew out of that whole era and that whole fight of welfare mothers saying, our children have a right to an education. We want to get out of poverty. And if they're going to get some job that's not cleaning somebody else's house or some other thing, we need to do something about education, right? And not only do we want open admissions, but our children, we need the money. We need the book money. We need the student grants. We need all of that in order to be able to, to function. So that was another great contribution of a women's led <laughs> welfare rights movement that was never acknowledged by the feminists. And I, I wanna just quickly tell this story about, Selma, you told the story about how they said, we need to go out to work and raise our consciousness. Well, at the school that I was at, there was so much racism and trash talking about the students in the teacher's room during the lunch and breaks that those of us who were black and brown couldn't stomach it. And we refused to go in there. And we went and we sat with the quote unquote teacher's aides who were the black and, you know, Puerto Rican, the black and brown women. And I remember the conversations of people saying, you know, I don't understand these white women talking about feminism. They talking about liberation is to get a job outside the home. And they said, we've been working outside the home from the days of slavery. We working now and we ain't free. This ain't no liberation. So it was really that kind of discussion that was going on even as the feminist movement was coming up and ignoring this movement led by black and brown women that was, as Selma uh, points out, a women's movement. So that was something that was going on in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. I wanna, again, fast forward real quickly because after leaving Ocean Hill, Brownsville, I went to teach in a, a program won by welfare mothers called the SEEK program, Search for Education, Elevation, and Knowledge in the city university system. And those were students who came from schools where they didn't learn too much of anything because they were discriminated against. They were bussed out to Kadarsi and whatnot, people spitting on them and throwing rocks at them. And, you know, not exactly getting the education needed to compete in a four-year university. So it was there in that program that I met the great late and Dae, those of you who saw the memorial yesterday, and Dae was part of that program from Guyana, um, the co-founder of Black Women for Wages for Housework, Met Brown. She was also um, part of that. And what we found out is, and also, Black Women for Wages for Housework was new. We had just begun, Selma, I won't go into the details about the racism that you described, but it's absolutely true. We had had it with those white women in Wages for Housework. We wanted to be part of Wages for Housework, but we weren't gonna stomach, we weren't gonna put up with the stuff that they were telling us and that they wanted to define for us what Wages for Housework was. So when we started working with women in the community, right, um, to demand that the city university not cut their welfare checks because they were um, getting a student grant, and that on the other hand, their student grant not get cut because they were on welfare, right? And for us, that was a wages for housework struggle. It was bringing together the, the community and the academy because a lot of the students who were there 
were raised by single mothers on welfare. You know what I'm saying? And then there were single mothers on welfare, obviously, trying to, you know, trying to survive in that situation. So we decided we're going to form a, a women's organization on, on campus. Selma, you may remember some of this history. We decided, we went to the women's center, which was, there was a women's center at that time, dominated by white feminists. And we said, we want to form the Queens College Women's Action Group to focus on these issues. And they didn't quite get it because we were focusing on money, <laughs> right? We are fighting for money. What does that have to do with the Women's Center? What does that have to do with feminism? We sorted, you know, we had to fight that one out. But we also had to fight it out with the men in the left who were on faculty at Queens College Women's Action. And a, a, and a lot of them, you know, you know not, to, not to put them down, a number of them were doing really good work in anti-imperialist struggles. They were Marxists. Look, what I know about Marx, I don't know a whole lot about Marx. I know about Selma James. I know about CLR James. I believe what Selma says about it, right? But I went to some of those study groups. I couldn't understand what the hell those guys were talking about because it had nothing to do with the, my experience, the experience of my mother or grandmother or the women in the village that I came from. But when we formed the Queens College Women's Action Group, and we're getting down to it now, we're going after some money, the men said to us, you are splitting our movement. It's not right what you're doing. And they opposed us. And then they said, furthermore, everybody knows that those women up at the Women's Center are a bunch of lesbians. And you all are going to be all labeled lesbians if you go and join them. If he says, you know what? So what? And if you give us a hard time, some of us may become lesbians just to get y'all off of our back, okay? So that was another fight that went on. We formed the Queens College Women's Action Group. We did a whole successful campaign uh, called No Cuts, Just Bucks, one of the first campaigns of Black Women for Wages for Housework, which we won and established a national precedent. This was autonomy. This was a women's-led struggle but it wasn't only the women, the young brothers that everybody thought were the troublemakers, you know, the, the gang members and, and whatnot, they started coming around the women's center. But we had um, protests, and we did a lot of them, where we would go in and take over the president's office and whatnot. They'd be like, we're going to come and do security. So we'll be in there raising hell. And the young bloods would be there at the door, like, you know, no, you can't come in here, whatever. So there was really a working relationship then with the young men that today are the very ones that are criminalized that you see now in so many of them in prisons. Moving fast forward from that, Ocean Hill, Brownsville, Queens College Women's Action Group. When I spoke on Friday night, I mentioned Houston, and the first um, congressionally mandated conference on women, which was part of the women's decade. I, I spoke Friday night about what we won at Houston, but I should just say that prior to Houston, the way that we got there as grassroots women, we were up against the feminists. We couldn't get our damn foot in the door, right? And none of them were telling us anything. We found out about it because we were up in Albany, ready to lobby on this same seat legislation we won, and we were practicing in the bathroom, and a white woman was in there, came out and says, you all sound like you're really doing organizing stuff, Mildred Robbins Leet, I'll never forget her. And Mildred said, do you all know that women are meeting to prepare for this conference on women? We said no, because ain't none of us told us nothing. But she got us, she made the way, told us when the meeting was happening and whatnot, and we showed up. And clearly, we saw what we were up against because those white feminists weren't giving up nothing. So we formed the Coalition of Grassroots Women that included Beulah Saunders from President of the National Welfare Rights Organization, Pauline Hayes from the American Indian uh, Movement, um, a sister from the Brown Berets, and us from Black Women for Wages for Housework. We had to push 
at the state um, conference level. In fact, how we got to the conference where each state had to organize delegations, right, to, and vote on them to represent that state at the conference. And they were keeping us out. And the feminists had a whole slate that they wanted to push that include none of us. Plus, the conference was being held in upstate New York. We didn't have no money to get there. So what did we do? We went and we occupied the headquarters of where they were organizing, which happened to be in the Avon building. And I remember calling Selma saying, we're in the Avon building and we're telling them we're not leaving till y'all give us some scholarships to get to Albany. And we won that. I later found out, um, Reverend Annie, that Marion Kramer from Welfare Rights was one of the people picketing outside the Avon building. We didn't even know each other at the time. So here you had wages for housework and you had the National Welfare Rights Organization in a way taking action together, even though we hadn't formally known each other in that way. So that's how we got me and Beulah, <laughs> you know, and Pauline to become official delegates in, in Houston and the rest is history in terms of what we did with the welfare rights, um, with the welfare resolution. One other thing I wanna say, cause I know I'm running out of time, which is an incident that happened in Houston related to women's autonomy is that as the coalition of grassroots women, we found out from the indigenous women and the Puerto Rican women that women were being sterilized without their consent. They would go in the hospital for something, they come out, their tubes are tied. This was widespread. In Houston, I went to the mic, so we decided we're gonna raise it up and get some support from this women's conference on it. I went to the mic to put forward the language that we had agreed to as women of color on this. And when I got to the mic, the famous feminist, Bella Abzug, who was the chair of the entire conference, shut my mic off and would not allow us to speak about the forced sterilization of women of color. All right. So that was some of what we were, some of what we were up against. I'm, I'm going to have to fast. I can't sell my no, the, the UN story we can't get into. We can't do any of that. But looking at what's happening today. There are struggles within all of the movements around autonomy. If we look at Black Lives Matter, for example, you see that happening. That movement is a multiracial movement. You do have Black Lives Matter organizations, and they tend to vary. You know, some of them are better than others, and they got all kinds of issues now around money and whatnot that came flowing in. But the way they dealt with it is they, some of them formed something called White People for Black Lives. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it, it, it wasn't like autonomy in the way that we here together in this movement and in this corner of the movement is talking about autonomy. And there still today is a lot of confusion about separatism and autonomy. One thing I do want to mention uh, and then uh, and wrapping up, going back to the slave days, you can imagine that some of the enslaved people were queer. Makes sense, right? There is a book by a young um, queer black man called The Prophet that tells the story of two queer people trying to survive as they could in slavery while having a relationship and all of the power relations that then happened between them and the other non-queer slaves and then the exploitation of the slave master men who were taking advantage of them in a particular way. I do have a reading list. Those of you who are interested in some, that is one of the things on the, um, on the, on the reading list. So from what I've experienced, from what I've known, from the training that I got in welfare rights movement, in the civil rights movement, knowing the role that women have played, the founding of black women for wages for housework. I do know, I don't know of a better way for what is generally called the working class to unify because that's how they, that's how they win, isn't it? 
Somebody was telling me yesterday, I think it was Vanette or somebody, there's so many of us. How come they maintain their control over us? They maintain their control over us by pitting us one against the other, by dividing us one against the other, or then you have some of the left and other people who say, forget about having a women's group, forget about having a queer strike, disability, et cetera. We all have to be together because that's the way we are going to defeat um, that class. Not so. The way to unity is autonomy, and it is autonomy with accountability. It is not just off going off and doing whatever we like as black women or as queer women going off and doing whatever we like, because what we do as black women will have an impact on the queer women. It will have an impact on the women or domestic workers in Peru. It will have an impact on B and Hector, the work that they're doing in Malaysia and Thailand, et cetera. So we have to work it out. We do have to be accountable one to the other. And just to, to just say, I just want to end with a, a quote. Some of you have known me for years, are sick of it, but it is a quote that Martin Luther King used quite a bit but it actually is a quote that came from the Bible I found out. I didn't even know that. That we have to continue to do this work as autonomous organizations with accountability internationally until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you.